Welcome back, everyone. Thanks, Ali, for having me again. No worries. Thank you Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I just want to pick off where Muhammad started um, about the social aspects that led to Karbala. Uh, and for me personally, when, when, when I went through the journey of reading about Ashura and preparing uh, the Majalis in the previous years, um, Mo and I would go through a lot of literature, a lot of content. Uh, we'd mainly assess the events of Karbala itself uh, and how to deliver it to the audience. But what fascinated me more was what social aspects, what social factors led to Karbala. And it was very um, difficult for me to understand this because just trying to fathom the idea of the Muslim nation, and not as a whole, obviously, but the Muslim or individuals in the Muslim nation wanting to kill the grandson of the Prophet, claiming that he had exited the religion, uh, for me it was hard to understand. I mean, it, it, it was actually, it was really difficult. So I, I went on a journey to understand what happened before that and what kind of events led to Karbala. Um, one crucial factor for me was the idea or the notion of social justice within Islam. Okay. And um, I came across a book... Uh, written by a Turkish author, Hamid Inayati. Um, he, he belongs to the Sunni school of thought. Mm. And uh, the book is titled Modern Islamic Political Thought. And, and what he does in the book is he dissects how the two sects differed in their political journeys after the death of the Prophet. And for me, uh, and, and, and according to the literature that I have, um, that I have read, I came to find that in terms of social affairs, the Muslim nation went downhill. Um, the status quo went downhill. The, uh, the idea that a Muslim's honour or financial status went downhill and the, the traditions of the Prophet that were practised or the traditions that the Prophet wanted to fight within the pre-Islamic era started to come back and we can see that really again today. So to me, what I, what I really wanted to understand is, were these social factors avoidable? And what would have happened if we actually did avoid them? Because we did have a lot of examples before and after Karbala that echoed the sacrifice of Imam Hussein. So essentially, um, there's, there's a general consensus that after the death of the Prophet, there was wild hysteria in, in the Islamic nation. Definitely. Um, and with it came corruption And as you mentioned Social justice became Like It wasn't there anymore um, It was removed And that had started with the, the corruption Even when the prophet was on his deathbed So Was that the instigator for The, the battle of Karbala? 100% I, I, I completely agree with you I mean for example, if you were to look at the the way the the individuals who claimed leadership after the Prophet, although there was, I mean, there there were no legitimate grounds for their leadership, especially from a Ithna Ashari perspective. Um, I mean, we can delve into that in a different discussion, but the uh, the policy that they set definitely led to Karbala and to the killing of um, Imam Hussein. And, and what I mean by that is that Imam Hussein had to stand in the, in, in the face of injustice and specifically social injustice, just like his brother did, which was the previous Imam, which is Imam Hassan, and especially like his father did. And if you were to look at, uh, for example, the voice of a human justice by George Jodak, if you were to analyse that, even not from an Islamic perspective, just from a simple social objective perspective, you would find that the policy set by Ali ibn Abi Talib did not agree with those who took leadership after the Prophet. I'll give you an example. So during the time of the second caliph, um, the distribution of the wealth, you know, like we have here Centrelink or in America, there's the social uh, security allowance. Yeah. Um, that had changed in how Rasulullah had organized it. And um, when we look at this, the way the second caliph approached these subjects, 
you would find that there were certain individuals who would favor who were favored over others and that wasn't in accordance to the tradition of the prophet um, although some people might label that as ishtihad and and there are arguments of course for and against it but what i want to bring to the, to the table today is that these social factors were very important in determining who actually stood by the sunnah of rasulullah um, so for example uh, i mean even before karbala occurred you would look at the revolution led against the third caliph and the policy set, set by the third caliph um, were really fascinating and i'd, I'd say they were I, I don't know how the Islamic society actually accepted at a time. And it shows you how certain people did not really agree with the values that the Prophet had brought with Islam. And that's something that Imam Hussein had to revive through his sacrifice. So if we look um, historically, Muhammad, can we safely assume that Imam Hussein took this uh, revolutionary stance to bring bring about social justice um, by carrying on the message of his brother and also his father before him. Of course, there were every single factor before Imam Hussein's uh, revolution in Karbala was basically a door opening to that revolution happening. Um, where, as he was speaking about um, the distribution of wealth and the policies of the third. Um, they began empowering the open enemies of uh, of Islam, of Ahlul Bayt, yep. which were Bani Umayyah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so by them empowering them, it became like with Imam Ali alayhi salam's time. Uh, it was he was trying to fix the mistakes of the previous. Of the previous. Yep. So we're looking at them as mistakes from. A twelver perspective, but if we look at them as, um, as let's say, an Islamic perspective from the perspective of let's say, uh, the Holy Prophet, how would Imam Ali would have dealt with this differently um, through the perspective of the Prophet? Uh, I'll give you an example. During the time of the Third Caliph, uh, and and if you were to read a uh, one of uh, the books of uh, Sayyid Muhammad Qutb who belongs to the Sunni school of thought, mm. he labels Uthman, the third caliph, and I, I, I don't mean this with any offensive um, intentions. Um, he labels his government as that of nepotism, whereby when he was placed in power in, in, in a very absurd way, the way the third caliph came into yeah. power, I mean, we can come into that discussion <coughs> another time. When he came into power, and uh, you saw that certain individuals who the prophet had exiled, you know, he told them, you are, you are to leave Medina. I'm not going to uh, perform revenge. You know, I, I, I remember this distinctly that when Rasulullah entered Mecca and one of the Qurayshis um, yelled out, today, or I'll say in Arabic first, al yawm yawmul malhama. So mm. today we're all going to get butchered because the things that they've done to Rasulullah, I'll give you one example. Rasulullah would be praying and they'd open the, the stomach of a cow or a sheep on him. Mm. I mean, to bear that as a human just for the message of God, just for the oneness of God. And he's coming back after all that, you know. Mm. One of the members of Quraysh goes, al yawm yawmul malhama. Mm. Today is the day where we're going we're gonna to get all butchered. Rasulullah replies, and this fascinates me. Honest, it, it, it sends shivers down my spine. Rasulullah goes, no. اليوم يوم المرحمة Today is the day of mercy And why am I going all the way back to Rasulullah? Like why do I have to go about 40 to 30 years back For, for a certain individual to understand events to happen 61 AH mm. um, So going back to uh, the policy set by the third caliph um, When he was in power The governors that you saw you know, in, in, in the regions where the Islamic state or the Islamic government had ruled, they were all part of Bani Umayyah. So no other individuals were actually ruling on behalf of the Muslim nation. Mm. The amount of corruption was completely absurd. I'll give you one example. 
uh, one of Osman's cousins and his brother, uh, his brother through breastfeeding. And if, if, if you guys want to look at that from a jurisprudential perspective, it'd be interesting. Um, he was a, the governor of Medina, and uh, uh, I, I believe his name is Al Walid ibn Utbah. Mm. Not the best type of people. I would definitely not take him as an example. Um, one story I remember reading um, is that he, I mean, he, he really liked his wine, really loved his alcohol. And of course, he's a governor. He had to lead prayer. And in one instance, he prayed the morning. Instead of praying two rikahat, he prayed four. Another and one. he turns around. And, and this is actually in Islamic books. This is not something that is hidden. This is not something that you have to really search for. This is there. He turns around. He goes, you guys want more? Like the more the merrier in a way. And it's pretty tragic. A governor who is a representative of the prophet himself is praying for the kaat instead of two. And I'm not trying to bring the whole idea of social justice or Islamic justice into salat. Mm. Because if you were to look at the policies of Imam Ali salam after coming into power, the people had realized that the selection of the first, second or third if it was a selection, you know, we could, we could talk later about how they did come into power and what social factors impacted that. But when, imam, when, when, sorry, when the imam did come into power, the imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam, of course, came into power through methods that differed from the, 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 the previous three. And it, it shows the first instance, and if I could use the word, maybe it's not even a term, the first instance of actual Islamic democracy where the people flocked all to Ali's house mm -hmm. and told him it's been years after the death of the Prophet, the Sunnah has collapsed, the affairs of the Muslim is abysmal, um, social justice is, is a myth at this point, mm -hmm. we need you. And the Imam told him, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to handle my justice? Are you, are you sure you want this? So it's my understanding that Imam Ali actually refused uh, to take leadership at the, in the first instance The imam knew that The, the people that Rasulullah dealt with Didn't change mm. And if imam I mean he did come into power But in, in, I mean, in his mind When he wanted to come into power After the three The main issues he focused on And, and it's, the, it's the main issues That Imam Hussein sacrificed himself for Was social justice Was the idea that an individual in a Muslim nation, in a, under a Muslim government, is honoured just because he's a citizen. Mm. Not because he relates to the caliph. Not because he fought this certain battle. So if you look at the time of Uthman, for example, certain people are getting more money from the treasury of the Muslim. Mm. You know? For example, uh, individual A, like Talha or Zubair, would get more than a normal individual who just converted to Islam. Mm. So, irrespective of a guy praying two rikat or four rikat, the way that the social affairs were dealt with were completely corrupt. So the imam had to deal with that in a way, and it's pretty fascinating. He had to deal with it in a way where he had to attend to justice as soon as possible. And the first thing that he did, the first thing that Imam Ali salam did was dismiss all the governors that Uthman had. And it's pretty fascinating. It wasn't, hey man, don't fold your hands in prayer. Mm. Realize that. It wasn't like, oh man, you guys are, aren't technically doing the fuqhi or the jurisp jurisprudential aspects as per the tradition of the Prophet. Mm. He focused on Baytul Mal. And I remember reading um, in Nahj al Balagha, which is the book. Um, of eloquence written by uh, uh, Sharif al Radi. It's a compilation of the Imam's speeches and, and sayings. Fascinating book. And it, it, this really surprised me, to be honest, uh, because uh, I mean, the way the Imam dealt with it, you'll find it in this, in this saying. They come to his house, they want him to be a caliph. It wasn't like, oh, hey, let's sit in a room and choose one. Mm. The people came. The people determined that Ali was going to fix the issues. So Imam Ali is attended to. We want you as the caliph. Imam Ali goes, are you sure? Because if I'm going to come into power, if I'm going to be your ruler, I'm going to be very just. 
And the question is, are you able to handle justice? Are you able to sacrifice that freedom that you claim that you want? That was the question, basically, that you were asking um, uh, about refusal. Mm. He didn't refuse, but deep down he knew that I don't think they're ready for this. They, they can't handle is it. Is that, is that because Imam Ali had understood that they had been through so many years of injustice that they didn't even know was happening or were they they were oblivious to and Imam Ali responded in this way because he's like well okay you guys are used to three caliphs dealing in a way that I'm gonna do the complete opposite like 180 degrees difference and they won't be able to handle because it's 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 hard to adapt to a new system of of justice and especially knowing that Imam Ali was uh, side by side with the prophet basically living and breathing the message of the Prophet. Definitely, man. I even, you even see it in instances other than Imam Ali. You, you would see that even during the time of the three that came after the Prophet. Um, one individual that I would definitely reference is Sayyida Fatima. Mm. Sayyida Fatima, uh, I remember in that book, Hamid Inayat, he, he explains this in, in a fascinating way. He goes, when Abba Dhar and Sayyida Fatima stood for the right of the Muslims for social justice, this was the first example of anti-capitalism in Islamic history. Mm. So look at what scope and look at what idea these guys are trying to propagate. They were way ahead of their time, by far way ahead of their time. So when the Imam came into power, and so an individual A would get, for example, $60, from the government, mm. or and the other individual would get a hundred, and different people would get different amounts, and then Ali came into power, and he'd be like, you know what, everybody's getting three dinar or three dollars. Mm. People are like, whoa, 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 I'm not used to this. Irrespective of God is one, two, three, or four, I'm not getting the money that I used to get. Mm. So Ali, what's to go? Like, why is this happening? And that's why you you saw individuals like Talha and Zubair. Wage war in Jamal. It's surprising. Talha and Zubair were very close to the Imam. And it was those examples and those lessons that the Muslims never learned from again and again and again and again all the way to Karbala took place. And I would say, I don't think they've learned till now. Till now, yeah. Definitely. I mean, look at countries in the Middle East. Yeah, definitely. The, the, co the co corruption is rife and the... the Economies are collapsing left, right and centre. People are putting their hands into countries when the people, the, the actual uh, citizens of those nations aren't really receiving the benefits of, of resources, of the economy. Definitely. And you've got outside powers actually putting their hands into these countries and just basically taking whatever they want. 100%. So is it, we have a question from, um, from one of the boys. Is it, he says, is it safe to say that the tribal ideology is against all social rights at the time of the Holy Prophet that he tried to abolish, came back at the time of the first three caliphs, and if so, how did it again disappear at the time when Imam Ali became the leader of the Muslims? I'll give you an example, actually. I, I know a specific story that would answer that question. I was talking earlier about Walid ibn Utbah. Yep. I'll give you some context about that guy. Walid ibn Utbah was sent to Yemen to convert the people to Islam, right? The Prophet had told him, go to Yemen, tell the people about Islam, and hopefully, you know, they, they accept the ideology. They don't agree with Walid. There's some indifference that happens. And then the Prophet has to send Ali ibn Abi Talib instead. The people of Yemen fall in love with Ali ibn Abi Talib. And if you were to look later, the closest disciples to Ali were all from Yemen. Yeah. Like Malik ibn al-Ashtar. Yeah. Like, Definitely. Yeah. Anyhow, Walid, when I said earlier, he prayed four rik'at instead of two and was drunk. The law, the law at that time was okay. You need you need to be whipped. Yep. You know, there's there's a uh, there is a uh, a legal repercussion for your actions. Yep. You need to be whipped for this. No one would approach to do that. Osman was the caliph at the time. He's his brother through breastfeeding and his cousin. People were afraid. You know, we have this this idea of wasta yep. in in the Arab world where um, if you know certain a or you're connected to certain a, you're protected from the law. From the law or you're above the law And no one would approach Walid To implement The Islamic repercussion That the Prophet came down to introduce mm. The only person who did that Surprise? I'm not surprised No, it was Ali Ali ibn Abi Talib With no fear of repercussions Because he knew That Ali 
himself knew in his inner self he is ready to establish justice at any cost available, even at the cost of death, which we saw in Karbala. So at this point, did the, um, Muhammad, did the Islamic nation accept the justice of Imam Ali alayhi salam towards uh, Walid ibn Utbah? Or, no. or was there was there like repercussions and uproar and of like what was. are you doing? Of course there was because Imam Ali, as he was saying, as he was fixing, he was also they were also waging wars against him. So what basically he spent his entire caliphate while he was fixing, they were waging wars against him because obviously they didn't do, they didn't like the way Imam Ali did things. So th- there were grudges held because of previous events and and uh, with the previous caliphs and especially at the time of the Holy Prophet as well. Yeah, of course. Um, I want to mention something he, he was mentioning about about that prayer, for example, yep. Walid Mahabda. Just to show the difference between the, the ones that upheld uh, the Prophet's teachings teachings, and the ones who obviously didn't. Because there's a lot of... Uh, nowadays, you know, people ask, and there's a lot of arguments about it. It's like, oh, you know, for the sake of unity. And, yep, yep. Um, what did Malik do, the one we read, when they, when they said, oh, everyone go pray, you know, separate? He said no. He said we yeah. don't we don't That's follow right. him jamaa, but we pray together. Mm. That's correct. So to keep that unity, so, so so they don't show that we're you know we're disunited. So a lot of people said that Imam Ali alayhi salam, for example, didn't. Um, oh, but he gave bayah to to the caliphs and whatnot. No, he was there, so there's no disunity in the ummah. And while he's doing you know this and. And things are going downhill as well. And just to go also back to favoritism and how you're saying, you know, individual yeah, nepotism, A, yeah, nepotism, yeah. yeah. Individual A gets more money and whatnot. What did Imam Ali do when his brother? Yeah, came? your own brother, your own family is coming to you for help. Yeah, and you're you're establishing justice at your own home. It's not like hey. I'm just, you get three dinar, you get three dinar, then your brother comes and be like, hey man, I'm doing it tough. And Akil was doing it tough. Mm. And he goes, man, I just need a little bit more. I think he asked for like a, like a bowl of, uh, of wheat more. That's all. It's, mm. It was really nothing. And what does the imam do? I mean, we all know this. He, to, to us, it's nothing. Yeah, I mean, but it's huge. But so so, so yeah. just, just for the sake of understanding the social justice of Imam Ali, let's... Yeah. Delve into that 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 specific yeah. instance. So, so the imam was the head of the state. The imam was the khalifa. The imam was the number one individual, right? And he, the people around him, his family, didn't live in 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 uh, like a, a mansion, mm. ordinary home. Akil comes to him because, man, I need I, I need more. I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing here mm. because I need just a little bit more. The imam replies by heating like a like a lodge of iron. Just hot enough, and he just brings it close to Akil. He doesn't let it touch Akil mm. because that's zulm, and, yep. and an imam would never do that. Yep. And Akil's like, Whoa, that's hot. Mm. And Imam's like, Man, you're afraid of that. How do you think I would be afraid from the one that God prepares? Mm. I'm going to be just at any cost possible. Literally, any cost possible. I'll give you another example. He was a caliph, head of state, right? You're the head of state. No one can talk to you. Yeah, Give you, me an Arab country want. where the head of state is as humble as Ali Nabi Talib. Give me a Western country that the head of state operates like Ali Nabi Talib. He was a caliph, right? Mm. And Ali is known as a great warrior. I don't want to delve into the traits of his um, his fights because I don't need to. There's no need. There's no it need to do that. Itself. It speaks for itself. The Imam had a shield. Christian took the shield. Christian's like, hey man, that's mine. Right? Mm. It's known as a Christian living in an Islamic state yep. or under an Islamic government. The Imam was like, no, it's mine. All right, let's go to court. So the Christian, understand this, the Christian, a Christian individual, a Christian citizen is taking the head of the Muslim state to court to, court, mm. to be ruled by a Muslim judge. So you'd think there'd be bias there. Yeah, I want to show you how just this Imam was. And I know we're focusing on Imam Ali now a lot and it's like, oh, what about Karbala? But yeah. I want to show you what kind of Islamic atmosphere the, the imam was trying to create and how the people just kept refusing it because they couldn't handle it. And it really begs the question, can I handle it? Can, mm. can we handle it? Mm. So they go to court. I think the, the judge was Shreyh al-Qadi, yep. I believe. Um, 
I mean, he 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 had another trajectory in history, uh, especially with Karbala. So Shuraih addresses the Christian, you know, by his name, and he goes, and then Amir al Mu'minin, which is the Prince of Believers, yep. or it's a it's a, uh, uh, a a title given to the ruler. Imam was like, whoa, whoa, stop! We haven't even started, and there's injustice. Mm. Not injustice on me, injustice on the guy on who's trying to steal his shield. Yeah. Like, can you fathom that? Yeah. So he's protecting the guy that's that's basically like yep. he's trying to rob him. Yep. <laughs> then the judge is like, okay, do you have any witnesses? Imam Ali's like, I have Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. He goes, we can't use them as witnesses. The conflict yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And he goes, the shield belongs to the Christian. Imam Ali accepts the verdict. He goes, okay. The, the shield's yours. And the Christian's like, whoa. I took the head of state to court, I stole his shield. And then I lost and the man accepted that decree and didn't use his power mm. to influence it. The man gave his shield back and he goes, man, I, I want to follow you now. So you see those same examples, they're replicated in Ashura. They're replicated when uh, Imam Hussein uh, wanted to bring down the hegemony of Bani Umayyah. And that hegemony was established and it began with the third caliph. There is no two ways about it. Look at every Islamic historian, you will see that the sunnah of Rasulullah, both in a social aspect and a religious aspect, went downhill, especially with the third caliph. Especially when Bani Umayyah started to come into Islam, you started seeing things like, whoa, man, let's bring back the pre-Islamic era because that was better. Yeah, definitely. That was better so than what was going on at the moment. Tribal mentality and, and basically wanting everything for themselves. Of course. So if the people had seen the justice of Imam Ali in full display. It was there every day of, of his rulership. Why is it that they, they rejected his son, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, from the caliphate and were more inclined to follow Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan? Look, Muawiyah was an interesting individual. Muawiyah came into power after his brother was ruler of Sham. I think his brother is called Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. He was appointed during the second caliph. And after he passed away, Muawiyah came to power. Uh, and Muawiyah really was, was operating as he liked. I, I believe Muawiyah had a propaganda. I believe Abu Sufyan had a propaganda during Uthman's time. Uh, so there was a, a, a intentional, uh, an, an, an intentional uh, set of behaviours to delineate people from the Islamic thought that Rasulullah had prepared them. And it's actually very, um, very obvious because only, 20 feet, only 25 years after the Prophet passed away, he had his wife and very close companions wage war on the present caliph, who was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Mm. And the way the Imam dealt with it, wow, you mm. can't replicate that. You can't make this up, yeah. really. You can't make this up. And the Imam was very conscious on the attempts he had to do in order to rectify the mistakes that happened. And to me, it's just fascinating that the, the, the people didn't learn. I'll give you an example. One of the companions um, of the Imam went to visit Muawiyah. Mm. And like I said, Muawiyah had a propaganda. I believe Muawiyah was some sort of a genius. You know, a lot of people don't like to hear that, but credit has yeah, to be given yeah, when it's due. It's true, yeah, definitely. And he knew, he knew how to, how to uh, talk to the masses. So the masses are there. Obviously, he had established a stronghold in Sham. He goes to the companion. He goes, hey, you, you ran away from the dhulm of Ali. The guy responds. He goes, no, definitely not. I ran away from the adil of Ali. Mm. Let me translate that. He goes, did you run away from Ali due to injustice? No. The guy replies, I ran away from Ali's justice. It's wow. Too, it's too much to handle. Wow. So if that was the case, and Imam Ali alayhi salam had, had, had basically reintroduced the message of the Holy Prophet into, into the fold of Islam. Definitely. And then Muawiyah comes along and basically goes back to his old ways or the old ways of Bani Umayyah and Abu Sufyan and, and basically the... The attack on Islam that had started pre, of course, um, 
uh, the Prophet going to to Medina, mm-hmm. um, and we find that the, the the journey of the corruption of of the religion of Islam continued all the way through to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So now we have Yazid in power. Imam Hussein is on his way to Mecca, okay, and Muslim Naqil is on his way to Kufa. Definitely. Okay. Go, and go back, go back. Go back. We'll start with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Because basically, Karbala, as we know, can't, couldn't have happened as, uh, um, as a, 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 right, a rightful battle from the side of Imam Hussein as being an Imam, a Hujjah. Of course. Right? Of God on earth. If it wasn't for Imam Hassan. Yeah. We, and especially the treaty that was made between Imam Hassan and Muawiyah, which was that, that if you read the treaty, you'll know, but, you know, do not attack the Muslims, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, distribution of wealth. It was similar to the treaty of Rasulullah. Yes, yeah, exactly. similar to Hadabi. I believe there was like 15 uh, policies that Imam Hassan uh, made Muawiyah sign. I mean, Muawiyah after it. Ripped the paper and stepped on it. The, the paper meant nothing. Yeah, yeah. And when you go even further, when your prophet is telling you, "Hey, man, let me write," when this happened on a Thursday, it's known as the calamity of, calamity Thursday, of Thursday, right? So, what does the paper really mean, really, right? Mm. The prophet was on his deathbed. He's like, "Hey, let me write you something that you won't go astray." And certain individuals are like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" The prophet's gone delirious. Or if you want to look look at the other interpretations, the the pain has overwhelmed the prophet. Yeah. The book of Allah is enough for us. Yeah. Really? I, I, I don't really understand what he meant by that. Or what his intentions were. So when you look at that sulh that was established between Imam Hassan and Muawiyah, after, after it was established, Muawiyah ripped the paper, stepped on it. And then now, 10 years later, after the death of Imam Hassan, you find Karbal had to take place. And one important piece of literature I would refer you to is the book of Abu Mukhnaf, yep. which is one of the earliest books written in terms of the events of Karbala. And in the beginning of the book, he focuses on one important aspect. It's the letter of Muawiyah to Yazid. And if you compare that letter to the letter Imam Ali left to Imam Hassan and Hussein, it's two ends of the spectrum. Mm. One was used in the UN, by the way. Yep. And the one used in the UN was not that of Muawiyah. I can assure you that. Mm. The UN has actually referenced the uh, the uh, the will of Ali to Malik and to his kids in the United Nations, and you see such difference of behavior, and it fascinates me how someone would say, "Yeah, Muawiyah did ishtihad. It's fine. Like, you know, he he thought he was right, but he was really wrong." Mm, I think it's more complicated than that. Of course, yeah, of it's course, it's way you, more complicated. When you look than at that. it in the grand scheme of things, it's yeah, it's definitely it's a lot more than what it is. So now, let's take the journey uh, with Imam Hussein. Yeah, the most important part of that paper that Muawiyah tore up and stepped on was that Imam Hussein rules after, not Yazid. Mm. So that was signed. That treaty being broken was the rightful excuse for Imam Hussein. So that, that, that basically was like, okay, you've broken a treaty and... By breaking that treaty, I have the right to rise up. Exactly. Okay, so now Imam Hussein in his position, in his position, he's, he's being exiled. Okay, and, and they're telling him, well, spill your blood in the Holy Land. Yep, even, even in the Kaaba part. Yeah. They, they told him, well, spill your blood in the purest of places. So what's, what's Imam Hussein thinking at this moment? What's, what's his, okay, what's his plan now? I am very, very, very happy that you asked that. I'd like to reference here Shahid Mutahari, mm. amazing Iranian author. He writes, he has a book called The Truth of Hussein's Revolt. Yep. Amazing book, very short, but very, very informative. And in that book, he states that the Imam did not rise over emotions or anger, mm. which isn't really the image we actually give during our majalis. He continues to talk. And say, he goes, the Imam calculated every step 
And that's an example when you understand why would he take his woman with him? Yeah. You know, you're you you literally have like a like there's like a death penalty on you. Yazid you decreed you're going to give me bay'ah or you are gone. You're dead. You know? Mm. And then he takes his woman with him. It really doesn't make sense. But in in reality, the Imam had overseen and was thinking way and way ahead. And when you look at it now in retrospect, when you look at the role of Sayyidah Zainab in Sham and how she addressed Yazid, you start to understand like, oh, that message was carried out by the women. The mission of Imam Hussein was definitely carefully calculated and he saw beyond his own martyrdom. Definitely. Um, and was looking towards the future of the Muslims and he put that future in the hands of Sayyidah Zainab. Yep, definitely. Where To the point where she protected the next imam. Yep. She, she stood in front of him and protected him. She exactly. used herself as a human shield to protect <coughs> the next imam. So Imam Hussein had, this was all premeditated. It wasn't as if like, okay, let's just go yeah, with the no, flow. No, let's no. see what happens. It was not emotional at all. This was very, very, very much calculated. And at the end of the day, Imam Hussein was a general. Of course. He wasn't just an imam like going to spread a mes- message. He, w- he was a general. He had an army behind him. But now, in the situation of Imam Hussein, you're traveling to Karbala. Having received, some narrations say, 14,000 letters asking for him to come to Kufa and they want him to lead them in Kufa. So what went wrong there? Wow, I mean, there's so many ways to answer that question. I, I believe, I mean, the general answer you'd get, firstly, is all, oh, it was Ahl al-Kufa. Yeah. And, and I'd like to step back from that, because it wasn't really Ahl al-Kufa. Mm. In reality, if you were to look at Ahl al-Kufa, they were among the most individuals who were accepting the leadership of the Imam, even towards the time of Imam Ali. You yeah. also have a lot of uh, warriors that joined Imam Hussein that were from, from Kufa. Yeah. Exactly. But what went wrong is what was going wrong all along. People did not want the justice, the true justice of Islam. Is it, is it because they didn't want it or because they were incapable of living in a system of complete justice? Exactly. Yeah, I, I would go definitely with option B. Definitely. So now you've got a tyrant ruler um, in Kufa and in Sham. And your imam... Who your prophet has basically said, like, this is your guy. This is who you follow. And 14,000 letters are sent. Muslim is sent to Kufa <coughs> to basically figure out what's going on. Like, where, where are we now? That's correct. So at, at that point, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the situation in Kufa was in favor of Imam Hussein. The people were ready. You know, you, you see letters in... Um, in detail, companions that were with, uh, with with the Prophet in early days, they were writing, yeah. and they were telling them, "Hussein, come! Like we are ready, we are behind you." And Muslim had Muslim Al Aqil, which was Imam Hussein's cousin. He had sent a letter to Imam Hussein telling him, "All right, things are things are flowing, things are in motion. Come to Kufa, and let's establish islah. Let's establish." At reforms and I'd like to use that word specifically because we hear a lot about, about it today and, and it really never happens but that was the intention of the imam so social reform, social reform yep. exactly I did not come as a tyrant I did not yeah. Come as, yeah exactly I came so, to reform the, the religion of my grandfather yeah I look at it like it, it's like the imam knew what we were going to think and he's answering that question he's answering our questions through that open or public intention so he publicly made that intention yeah and, and just uh, to go back to the letters that um, were sent from Kufa, a lot of them were very specific and mentioned very specific things. And um, I think it's Sayyid ibn Tawus in, in his book, Luhuf uh, ala qatala tutufuf, or the pangs of sorrow um, on the events of Karbala. Um, he actually uh, has those letters in the book. And like you see some of them, they're addressed to Imam Hussein and they're saying basically like, we're ready to go. Tell us what you need. We're at your service. Yeah, yeah. But then Muslim Aqil in the mosque, he turns around. There's no one, no one behind him. There's no one there. Yeah. So again, it was the propaganda of Bani Umayyah. 
the same steps so Huawei had used. Fear mongering. Fear mongering, yeah. Um, propaganda. So when they found out that Imam Hussein was headed towards uh, Kufa, he sent Ibn Ziyad yep. as uh, as the uh, leader to, to lead Kufa, yep. um, as a governor of Kufa. But he entered dressed as Imam Hussein. That's right. And, and the, the people, people believed it. And the people believed it. Yeah. So there was there was a lack of awareness, really. Like there was a lack of really intense awareness to actually understand what was going on. Is that again because they had been so ingrained in this system that was so far from the actual religion of the Holy Prophet that they, they were just like whatever it is, it is exactly. And people were kind of sick of it, like you know. A lot. Of, uh, sorry, I was speaking to. Someone the other day, and they said, "You know, Ahl Kufa, yep. the people of Kufa." I said, "No, okay, you can't say that. Okay, you can't. Every time someone says, oh, you know, people of Kufa, they betrayed, they betrayed.' No, you have some of them that were literally pummeled with feet, mm. um, public executions to basically scare them into into silence. Silence. Yeah. You had propaganda. You had um, people that were tired of wars." You know, they just wanted to live. They just, they just wanted to be Muslims and like, enough's enough. Yeah. Whoever the caliph is, not, is the caliph. We're not talking from yep. a twelve yep. perspective. Yeah, no, no, definitely. You know, like the Imam came, so you must follow him. No, no, no. Like from an Islamic oh, wow. perspective, this is an Islamic yeah. nation that had literally, from the death of the Prophet, been through war after war yep. after war. And Imam Ali, you said it yourself. Like his whole, his whole caliphate, his whole leadership was riddled with wars. Yeah, three wars. Imam faced three wars. Because of that as well, like mentioning Imam Ali, the person that actually planned the assassination or, you know, um, put out the word was basically sick of wars mm. because her father and her brother was killed in, they were in, killed. in, in they the were wars, killed in the wars, fighting with Imam Ali. That's right. You know, so she's like, it's because of him, you know, war after war after. And the thing is, we're looking at it from, a, you know, a general, yeah, no, definitely, yeah. <clears throat> we're not looking at it from, ah. Oh, we hate her. Or, you no, know, no, no. We're looking at it from a yeah. perspective. Like, okay, where, where this social injustice was so rife in, in the Definitely. religion of Islam. Correct. Definitely. So now, this Muslim nation, or let's, let's go specifically in Kufa, under the governorship of Ibn Ziyad. They are tired of wars. They are bombarded with propaganda. Exactly. Scared into silence. And basically, they're just tired. Like... Yep, to that's put it correct. simply, to of put course. it simply, they're just tired of, that was a big of everything well. that's going on. So, what led them to this? Okay, they're tired, but what led them to turning on Muslim Naqil, knowing he's the the cousin of the Imam and the the messenger of the Imam, coming to basically tell them, okay, your Imam is ready for you. I, I think there's multiple factors, but one of the main factors was money. Was gaining wealth, so even and it became a pattern. You know, um, there's an ayah in the Quran that describes the companions of the Prophet that says, yep. You know, there's this uh, uh, there's this rush for the individual to do good, mm. morally speaking, of course. Yep. That really wasn't a pattern that was followed anymore, and people just wanted to accumulate wealth, accumulate wealth, accumulate wealth. But to what end? I mean, if you compare it to the the lifestyle Ali lived and which got him killed was that I'm head of state. If the poorest person is just eating bread and salt. I'm eating bread and salt. I'm eating bread and salt. It's not like the imam never ate meat. The imam was very conscious of what he was doing. It wasn't like, oh, hey, man, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not going to touch meat. And I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do this all my life. You know, in Dawat last year, the Imam actually had some meat because he was preparing the food when Rasulullah was announcing his prophethood yeah. to his family. You know, but the Imam lived the lowest possible social life in comparison to the poorest man or the poorest citizen in the Islamic State, or as a citizen in the Islamic State, that no one would say. Oh, he's living better than me. Mm. I mean, to that extent, no one can actually comment on that. No one can be like, oh, no, the imam actually wanted wealth. There are a lot of other attempts to be like, 
or say the Fatima had some greed towards Fadak, yeah. um, they, they're dismissed. I would refer the book of uh, Sayyid Muhammad Bakr Sadr. He has a book called Fadak in Islamic History. Yeah. Fascinating. He, he disarms all those arguments very well. But what I'm trying to get to is there's a khutbah for Imam Ali alayhi salam describing his um, companions or the ones he or the ones who were with him in war and he calls them Ya Ashbah Rijal Walastum Rijal You are like men You're not a man yeah. You're like a man You look like a man Yeah, you look like a man but you're not actually a man and he knew that the attitude of the Islamic nation would not serve the message of God well because the people simply wanted to accumulate wealth. And that pattern was established very, very obviously from the third caliph. And it continued all the way, all the way to individuals like Omar bin Sa'ad. Omar bin Sa'ad was not stupid. Omar bin Sa'ad was not a fool. He was aware he was killing. He was conscious of it. It wasn't like, oh, Imam Hussein is a kafir, we're going to kill him. He was like, whoa, ray. Yeah, you yeah. know, I'm be giving a land just to kill this person. And maybe in two years, I can repent. So he knows what he's doing is wrong. But there was that greed, like, I want more, and I want more. Yeah. And that behavior was only adopted because the previous leaders showed that behavior. And when someone like Ali didn't, the people are like, yeah, man, we, 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 don't, we don't want this. It's we can't, we can't handle this. It's not good this. enough for us, yeah. yeah. I just remembered something. You know, you were mentioning about money. You know, money, money, that, that was their focus. If you go back to Uhud, the archers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they yeah, they, they what, left. They, they all they ran because they saw the booty of war. They didn't saw the booty of war. They exactly. left. And, and they left uh, yeah, Rasulullah over. exposed to Khalid exactly. and Walid. So yeah, that's the same. Yeah, it, 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 it's constantly repeating itself. And even today... Even today, looking at the Arab same. nations, it's the same story same over thing. and over and over again. And I think the cycle, um, I, that's, I think Imam Hussein set out to break that cycle, to bring about social justice, to bring about social reform and, and the reform of the, of, the, of the message of Islam in itself. But now he's faced with a dilemma. His, his cousin, his messenger has been killed by um, Ibn Ziyad yep. thrown off a castle and dragged through the streets Han Ibn Arwa has been killed yep. that was, an, that was an, uh, also an example of Should I? let's establish fee among the people yep. beyond our rising the state we're going to crush you you know it's like how the communists rule with an iron fist yeah. like you have to be scared of us because if you're not a, a loyal citizen to this corruption you're going to get crushed and we're going to we're going to show everybody it's basically What's setting an happen? example. Setting yeah. an example through exactly. Hanif and Arwa. And, and you'll find something interesting. When Imam Hussein got the letter that Muslim bin Aqil was assassinated and was killed, it was about midway through Karbala. He didn't turn back. He didn't turn back. He was like, whoa, they, they killed him. Things are not in my favor. Let me turn back and protect myself. Imam Hussein looked into the eyes of death, literally, and was like, death over humiliation. Imam Hussein was not going to give by any cost he was literally he was like, determined to follow through with the message he set out yeah to. like at any cost literally as it was like bayah or death i chose death you know yeah and it surprises me how this individual is not recognized internationally and especially among the western world when you have people like patrick henry mm. you know one of the american revolutionaries who says give me liberty or give me death and he's honored you know he's an example to the world why isn't Hussein bin Ali used as an example? He, he done that way before and, and for way even before, more yeah. than just liberty. He, he came about and not just, um, it wasn't just about social justice. Of course, that's our focus today, but he came about to show like at the end of the day, we're human. Yep. At the end of the day, we are human, regardless of Muslim, Sunni, Shia, yeah, Christian. Yeah. It didn't matter. Of course. It, to the Imam, it did not matter. You have a respect just because you're a citizen of a state, I'll give you a, a story. Imam Ali alayhi salam as a caliph was strolling through the through Kufa, and again head of state yep. strolling, you know, observing the public, and he sees a man begging for money. And Ali is like to his companions, "Why is there a man under my rule begging for money?" They're like, uh, "Ali, he's a Christian." He's like, "I didn't ask about his religion." Mm. 
Why is there a man begging? You used him during his youth to work for us. And now when he's old and incapable, you don't help him? Give him from the treasury of the Muslims. Mm. Hold on a sec. This guy isn't a Muslim. This guy shouldn't be getting the money. But the imam is giving someone from another religion, from another ideology, the money of the Muslim treasury, of course, in a just way to show that under my rule, the birds won't get hungry. Mm. And he told them, make sure to sprinkle wheat on the mountains so nobody is hungry. Look at the focus of the imam. He wasn't like, hey man, the prayer has to change or certain aspects of the adhan were altered. Let's bring that back. They are very important, by the way, but it wasn't the imam's focus. And when you look at, because Imam Ali showed us or Imam Ali demonstrated a government that was led by a mahsoom, by an infallible, the way that we believe it had to go. So we do have an example of how things went. And when you look at how Ali conducted himself politically, as a politician, I think everybody is fascinated. To the extent that certain Christians like George Urtak is calling Ali the voice of human justice. Yeah. Wow, like to me that's fascinating. What more do you need? What more do you need? So now, what's Imam Hussein's stance? Essentially, he's, he's been blocked from going to Kufa. He's diverted towards Karbala. What, what's, what's his, his stance now? Where is he going with this? Look, there's so many examples I can use to, sh to demonstrate Imam Hussein's stance. But I believe I could possibly sum it in two lines that he used. And I'm going to say in Arabic first just to be able to translate it. He goes, Wallahi, laqad wada'ani bayna sillati wa dhilla. Right? Either I give bay'ah and Yazid is accepted, recognized as a caliph, or I don't. And Imam Hussein knew the repercussions of him not giving bay'ah. Not, oh, he's going to die. But the, the way the world is going to view that, because if you look later, there were more revolutions against Bani Umayyah. Yep. And Bani Umayyah crumbled after that. I mean, Yazid attacked the Kaaba. Yazid attacked Medina. Right? And then you had another Hussein from the family of the Prophet actually wage war. You had Zayd yep. wage a war. So it wasn't, oh, Imam Hussein was the only individual. But I'll explain, I'll explain it like an analogy like this. You have an earthquake, and post the earthquake, you have little earthquakes. Yep. Imam Hussein was the major one, and the little earthquakes were, were certain tremors. individuals. Yeah, tremors. And you see them till now. Until this day. Yeah, certain countries have liberated themselves on the thought of Hussein ibn Ali. Yeah, definitely. You, you, know? look, you look at Yemen now and, and the stance they have. It's, it's, of course. It's the same concept. Like there's oppression, and we're here to break that, that cycle of oppression. Definitely. So now Imam Hussein's looking at this. He's walked into a battle where. If we're honest with ourselves, he does not have the manpower. Yeah, yeah, the odds were against him. Some narrations go to 40,000. Some weaker narrations go, go even higher. Yeah, that's right. A lot higher. Um, so he's walked into a battle with his family, his, his, his brother, his cousins, his, his son, his nephews, um, and the women. Yeah. The women of, of Rasulullah. Of course. I mean, I'll show you an example. Uh, we were talking earlier about the tactics used by Bani Umayyah in terms of the fee and the propaganda. The night before the tenth, the night before the battle, Imam Hussein dims the lights. Mm. Right? This is so fascinating. He dims the lights. And he goes, let everybody of my companions partner with one of my household and leave. Imam Hussein gave him a choice. He wasn't like, hey man, I'm your imam. Be with me, please. I need somebody next to me. Imam Hussein was so honourable that he was ready to face all of Bani Umayyah by himself. Yeah, on his own. Literally, yeah. as an individual. Try to imagine it. Let's say you have 10,000. You yeah. know how there's narrations that say 40. I've seen narrations of 120,000. Yeah, 000. yeah, definitely. But let's say there's 10,000, right? Even less than that, it doesn't really matter. Who is brave enough to stand alone, literally, by yourself? You're that determined to be like, no, I am not giving bayah. You can cut me into pieces. You can behead me. And he knew that. And it wasn't suicidal. It wasn't like, oh, I'm sick of life. 
I want to die. No. He was like, you know what? I'm going to stand in, front, in the face of Yazid, even if I'm going to get beheaded. It was a man on a mission. Yep. And look over here he is now. But he says something in Arabic, or say, mythly, la yobah yo mythly. Exactly. He doesn't mean it in a conceited way. Someone like me does not give allegiance to someone like him. So, so what does the Imam mean by this? Like in, in the context of where he is, what does the Imam be, mean by like someone like me will never give allegiance to someone like you? The Imam is trying to, the Imam is trying to raise basira. The Imam is trying to raise, uh, raise conscientiousness towards haq. To identify himself as a hujja, to be like someone who has my traits, Someone that has my lineage would not give bay'ah to someone that, that is like you, who did not pray, who would drink alcohol, who would kill the respected self, as the Imam narrates specifically. But more so, even in an in, in, in a, uh, ego eye view, righteous. the Imam was trying to establish a righteous society mm. by stating himself as an example, like Misli, he knew it. And that's why the mission of reform was from day one for the Imam, yeah. despite the difficulties. And you were saying before how Imam Hussein says um, uh, his, his mission, sorry, um, and he says uh, he says something, and I'll link it to what you were saying. Uh, when Ali Akbar asks him, "Are we marching towards death?" And yeah. then he says to him, "Alasna ala haq." Are we not on the Are true we not path? On the righteous path, haq in this in you can look at it in two ways: is a haq as in the rights, and haq as in truth. Mm. Right, yeah. and then he goes, "Yes, we are." And then Ali Akbar replies, "He goes, then we do not care if death falls upon us, or we fall fall upon death." So that was also another uh, basically nudge at where you know we are going to establish a righteous government. Definitely. So at what, any what, cost possible. What baffles me is that his family and his companions took a leaf out of Imam Hussein's book. It baffles me. At the end of the day, he is an infallible. Let's look at him as an infallible, as a leader, as a general. But his companions, given the, the chance to go, to leave in the darkness of the night, and then you have Ali al-Akbar, or for example, Al-Qasim, narration say he was 12, 13 years old, yep. and he's asked, how do you say death? To me, it's sweeter than honey. Yeah. And then you have children, children, the, the sons of uh, Sayyidah Zainab, Aoun and Muhammad. Why were they so convinced in the message of Imam Hussein? What, what conviction did they have? And how did they, they look at Imam Hussein and be like, you know what, you're right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight with you. They saw Rasulullah through Imam Hussein. The sunnah of Rasulullah was living through the veins and the blood of Imam Hussein. He was the embodiment of the sunnah of Rasulullah. And to reject that person, or actually on the other side, to actually follow Imam Hussein or to fight alongside him was like fighting alongside Rasulullah. And that's what they desired. That's what they desired. Um, speaking of that, we can go to someone that baffles me and him always. When we used to sit there reading and writing the Majelis, someone that used to just... I remember the all-nighters, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone that used to make our, make our heads scratch, you know? The, the, Zuhair ibn yeah. yeah. How is it that an individual who fought Imam Ali, all right, in the battle in the battle of Jama, and he was a Uthmani, so he was a follower of the third, okay? How is it that he came to the point where in... The ratios of uh, Abu Mukhnaf, he says he's the one that said, you know, when Imam Hussein told him in the night, you know, leave. Mm. He says, you know, if we are killed um, a thousand times and then we are revived and then we're cut into pieces and then we are burnt and then our and ashes scattered, scattered yeah. and this happens to us a thousand and a thousand times, we will never leave. Never leave you. Yeah, how, how does that? I don't understand. Okay. You, you have many examples of individuals in Karbala who looked at, like, if we were to look at social justice and relate it to today, today, with everything that's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, you look at John. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You look at John and, and the way he spoke of himself, the way he 
pictured himself and the way Imam Hussein responded. He goes, he goes to him, let my dirty blood mix with your pure blood. Wow. Wow. That's fascinating. Let my, let my bad odor mix with your beautiful scent. Yep. And then Imam Hussein comes to him after his marad and he, he puts his cheek on his cheek and like, yeah. That, that's a powerful message. Of only course. He only done that with two people. Yeah. His son Ali Al Akbar and John. And wow. John. Wow. And then, As a slave. And see, that's what made him, that's what John, that's what made him cry. Yeah, yeah. He was shocked. He's like, who is like me? That the son of Rasulullah puts his cheek. Puts his cheek upon my cheek. You look at John and then the mess said, Imam Hussein didn't do anything just Haphazardly Just, no, just yeah. for the sake of doing it No putting, putting his cheek On the cheek of a black man That's a big message And not Like we're talking 1400 years ago We're that's talking right. a time Where these people Were not respected Whatsoever No no They were treated yeah. Worse than animals yeah. And just go back to the 1960s And see how the western world Was yeah. dealing with the black the, people The civil rights movement In yeah. America and, and the way Even today Today yep. The way uh, Blacks Are treated in America Even here in Australia yep. With the aboriginals Of course and look at Imam Hussein 1400 years ago. He sends a message that has lasted this long. Yep. How powerful. He, he's, he's, How powerful. That in itself is social justice. Of course. Something very, very small, but yet it echoed throughout history. Yeah, definitely. And we're talking about it, what, 1400 years later? Yep. Until now, it baffles us. Yeah. And until now, it baffles yep. the Muslims. Yep. Like, Before, how can a man. Before John was killed, I mentioned something, I was reading it. He was kneeling down and he was waiting. Mm. So Imam Hussain, after he gave the speech, and he said, you know, leave in the night. And John was by himself, just looking towards the battlefield. And Imam Hussain comes and he whispers, to, he, he can hear John whispering something. And what he was saying was, in his mind, it's like, I have been with, you know, Abadar, because he was Abadar's uh, Slave. servant. Yeah. I've been with Ali ibn Abi Talib, I've been with Al-Hassan, and he goes, and I am not leaving here until I give every last drop of my blood in service of this man. Mm. So Imam Hussain hears him saying this, and he's saying it to himself, and he goes to him, John, he goes, you are old, yeah, you know, you've done your part. You don't, you don't need to fight. Yeah, you've done your part, you've served, you know, and, and throughout his service, that's what, a lot of people don't understand throughout his service he clung on to them yeah definitely they, they let him go so Imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam um, I was reading he actually paid for him and freed him yep. but he he gave he told him to go to Abadar and he began to learn the ways of Ahlul Bayt wow through Abadar amazing and then slowly, slowly, that it embedded in him yep. so by the time I got to Imam Hussain this guy saying I'm going to live I'm going to give you know, every last drop of my blood in service of him, of my master. And Imam Hussein tells him, he goes, you're a free man. You mm. you know, you're an old man. It's not, it's not compulsory for you to fight. Yep. And he said, he says something that shocked me. He goes, us, he goes, in our comfort, when we're comfortable, he goes, we, it's, it's a bit of a vague translation. He goes, we lick your boots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there there is a loss of meaning in the translation, yeah, 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 but definitely. I understand what you're trying to say there. Definitely. But he's saying it. Yeah, yeah. Of course. He goes, and and now that you're in hardship, you want me to leave you? He goes, never. Wow. He goes, I will not leave you until my, what you said, my, you know, my dirty blood mixes with your blood, yeah. my scent, uh, my my stench uh, is wretched, my lineage is is wicked, and he goes, blow on me a scent. That makes, that brightens my face after my death, um, makes a nice, brings a nice scent from my body, mm. and my lineage becomes pure. Pure. Wow. Like to that extent where he's he's looking at this like in the future, my people, by lineage, he's not saying like I'm dead. Yeah. yeah I'm dead. So because I'm not gonna. Whoever comes after me, his people follows wow. follows Ahlul Bayt. That's amazing. I haven't even thought about it like that. Like you look oh at my like God. like wow. You were talking about uh, Basira. For conscientiousness, that's that's the essence of it. Yep. Like understanding that I'm standing with the truth, yeah, definitely the truth in essence, like the truth manifested as a man. 
Forget wow. that he's an imam. Yep. Forget that, like, take that out of the picture for now. Awesome. You look at him and what he stood for. And then another instance of social justice is his brother, Al Abbas. Yeah, like, we, we always remember him as this warrior and, and a lion of God. And I mean, he's the son of Imam Ali. Like, what else is he going to turn out to be? You know what I mean? Definitely. But when Shimr, who eventually is the one that beheads Imam Hussein, he comes to him and he, he goes to uh, Al Abbas. He's. he's we're related. Yeah. We're cousins. Come on, man. I can give you a free passage. Come, Come with me. Wow. Bring Ali al Akbar. Bring. But his reply is the same reply that Ali ibn Abi Talib would say. He tells him, I give you a letter here that pardons you. You're, you're fine. You're safe. You and your three brothers, Uthman, mm. Abdullah, and, and Jafar. That's right. He goes, Just come to our side. He said, You give me a letter of pardon. And you give no letter to the son of the prophet. The son of the prophet. It's quite yeah. ironic, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Uh, but the, see, that instance is like, even relation did not matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it didn't matter because at the end of the day, we're standing for something. We're, we're on a mission to show people or to, to demonstrate yep. to, to the future. It wasn't for them. No, definitely. It wasn't for, it's for us. Yeah. Like to demonstrate, like it doesn't matter if your cousin or your brother or your family friend or whoever's on the other side. Like that's, wow. that's a problem that we have. Salman, Salman was told, if you see all the people going one way and Imam <laughs> Ali going the other, exactly. follow exactly. Imam Ali. One person, this, this is an instance of that. Definitely. One person, because uh, Hussein uh, mentioned something before about the Christian man with the, uh, with the shield. One person is actually not mentioned enough is Wahab. Yep, yeah. definitely. Wahab, Wahab is Wahab. a Christian man who just got married. They say he was around 18 years old with his wife and his mother. So honeymoon phase we're talking about. Honeymoon yeah. phase. Yeah. And by coincidence, or I don't believe in coincidence, mm. Imam Hussein's tent, his caravan stops right next to where Wahab is stationed with his mother and his newlywed. How does he become... How does he follow Imam Hussein in that path? And he's a Christian man. Yeah. That foresight that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. He listens. He walks out. He goes, who's this man? Imam Hussein, every time he was stationed on the way from Mecca to Karbala, he would, um, he would stop the caravan, set up basically a place where everyone would gather, all his companions, and he'd give sermons. And there's a misconception as well in, um, in that only 70, 72 joined Imam Hussein. There was actually thousands. Yeah, definitely. There were. Definitely in the beginning, yeah. yeah. But that, that number did produce. Every it time. Do, it, it was like Muslim. Yeah. It was like Imam Ali. Yep. Every single time Imam Hussein would give a sermon, these people were like, hold on a second. I'm not here to die. Yeah. 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 I've got a family to feed. I've got you know, money to make. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I've got things to do. I've got a wife to live. Yeah, yeah. There was an inclination towards accumulating wealth. And the individuals that stayed with Imam Hussein, especially when you were mentioning Abu al-Fadl. And to me, there's one line that really um, echoes that. As, as he's about to go and get the water, he goes to Imam Hussein, لَقَدْ سَئِمْتُ nifaq." I am over the hypocrisy, not, of, not just of the people that he was fighting, over the Islamic society as a whole. Yeah. And that was showing... Oh, I mean, Abu al-Fadl was trying to demonstrate how the social Islamic values are above all, including family, and including yourself, and including any other materialistic understanding. And that's why when you look at Islam, specifically in social justice, it far surpasses Marxism, communism, capitalism, postmodernism, Any kind of ism. Literally. The ideals presented within Islam in a perspective introduced by social justice, are the highest form. And to me, that is fascinating that all the imams were ready to establish that and try and find if any imam contradicted any another. Try to find if the behavior of Imam al-Hassan differed from the behavior of Imam al-Sadr ah, in, terms of, establishing imam, uh, in okay. terms of establishing social justice. That's why we have uh, some, one of the ulama, like Sayyid Khamenei, he has a book 
It's called the 250 year old being. So he looks at the 12 imams as a as one as person. As a single being, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not single beings. Yeah, they're all definitely. each imams. But he's looking at them as one person trying to establish a political slash social ideology in the world that is going to echo to today. Yeah, definitely. So Imam Hussein in this, in this grand mission challenged racism. He challenged oppression. He challenged injustice in in its essence and all like i could the list goes on and on yep. and on and on definitely and then after his martyrdom we see say the zainab stand up in front of a tyrant yeah and and people go out to say oh women don't have all this kind of stuff in islam and then you see say the zainab say the zainab who has seen her whole family massacred yep massacred butchered to bits ali akbar they couldn't pick him up that's right yeah yeah. They couldn't pick him up. They pick up one side, the other would fall. Yeah, definitely. She saw her own sons, Aun and Muhammad, be butchered. Her her brother, her protector, Abu Fadl Abbas. Yeah, all her family members have gone. Even even that mentioning her, her sons. All right, what did she do? She she went <laughs> she went into submission. Yeah. And she said, Oh God, please accept this little sacrifice. Yeah, perhaps. And then even after, when Imam Hussein had been beheaded. She went up to his body. Oh Allah, please accept this little sacrifice, this I mean, small sacrifice. What did she see, right? When she was asked by Ibn Ziyad, what did nothing, she see? Nothing, nothing but beauty. How can you interpret that, man? You how, can't. How can there you was, there's you so that? much wisdom behind that ver- that line. I was once listening to a brother, and he said he goes because she understood the true meaning of La ilaha illallah. Wow, it reminds me of how her mo- her mother conducted herself. Yeah, and it shows you that those attempts. To re-establish social justice were, were consistent with these individuals. Definitely. Sayyidah Zahra rose up, Sayyidah Zainab rose up. All these individuals rose up to women or men, doesn't matter. Yeah. The gender At he the didn't matter. At the end of the day, it yeah. was the same message. It was the same message. To, to be that, honest, I, I find I find say the Fatima and say the Zainab's speeches stronger than sort of men's speeches. <laughs> yeah, no, right, no, yeah. definitely, they begin them definitely. Like, with with such the, yeah. the fervor and Wow. Firmness and strength, like yeah, yeah, know that yeah. I am Fatima. Yep. Yep. Right, say the Zainab. You know your days are numbered. Wow! Like That's who staunches to a a, a tyrant? Like, <laughs> literally, the whole country was in fear. Yeah. yeah, from this guy, and she's staunching right in front of him. So and mind you, they had technically, physically lost the battle because they all died. Definitely, yeah. but then then she stands up and she basically hands it back to him, like, okay. We're all dead, but yeah, you go take this. And and look how she connects the dots. You know, when he tells her your brother exited your, the religion, he goes, "My brother exited the religion. <laughs> it's you and your father. That's who exited the religion." She she, she did not back down. From yeah, standing up for Imam Hussein's message, and exactly. in fact, she continued that message. She was the most important individual in re-establishing the message of Karbala. And that's why at the start of this discussion, we mentioned like why. Would he take the women? Exactly. And that's exactly yeah, why. Yeah. Because they saw the whole journey. Definitely. Definitely. The whole journey. And the Arabs, the Arabs, they knew you can't kill the women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, it was among the Arab, uh, 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 what do I say, custom? Yeah. Not to th- kill the th- women. They knew that. So maybe the Imam calculated that. Look at that wisdom. Yeah. Maybe the Imam calculated like, that. He maybe. knew, like, yeah. as bad and as, as disgusting as these people were. That's right, yeah. I'm going to take my sister because. I need someone to continue the message. My, wow. my son wow. is, is ill. Yep. My son is ill. He, yep. I wouldn't say he's incapable, but the fact that Sayyidah Zainab was the one to jump in front of him when Amazing. he was about to be attacked. And she's the one that gets up and gives the first speech. Yep. The first speech in the court yeah. of Yazid. Yeah, they did not show weakness. No, no, no. None in front all. of Yazid. None at all. Or in front of Ibn Ziyad or in, on, in Karbala. The Imam did not show weakness. Yeah, they would cry inside. We mentioned them in Majalis. Yeah. Me and Talib have come across that many times. You know that she would go in the tent and cry. At the end of the day, Sayyidah Zainab was a human being. Definitely. But when she was facing her opponent, an opponent who she differed with ideologically, she was fierce. She was really fierce. That's why the Imam Ali says, my daughter Zainab is Ali Maghair Muallama. Mm. I mean, translate that, man. How can I translate that to English? Someone who knows but isn't taught? Yeah. I think it's lost in translation there. It, it is, it is. It you, is can't, yeah. you can't translate the, the, the real um, exactly. meaning of that. Exactly. And even Imam Zain al-Abidin repeats it. Yeah, yeah. 
Definitely. Amati Zainab, Alima Gayr Mu'alna, Fahima Gayr Mu'alna. Like she, she's knowledgeable without being taught and she's, mm. she's a, a scholar. Yeah, man. Even, even to link that with the 12th Imam, I, I don't want to go off topic here, but I want to just focus on that role of women. In that time when the, when the Imam was born, the women played a vital role in translating the Islamic community from a direct Imam to the representatives. Yep. You know? The, the women played a very vital role within the ideology, and it, it doesn't surprise me. I think I think um, it's it's sad that uh, Muslims in particular have have this perspective that women were never given a stage. Yeah. It, it's it's upsetting because you look at Sayyida Fatima, or even before Sayyida Fatima, you look at her mother Sayyida Khadija, and the role she played, and then Sayyida Fatima, and then Sayyida Zainab, yep, yep. and then. Literally every single wife of the imams that came afterwards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially, especially the wife of Imam Hassan al Askari. Yeah, definitely. Sayyidah Nar, just the, the mother of the present imam. That's right. And the women in that household who are willing to sacrifice. Of course. To keep the message alive. And that was, it was all about that, really. That's all it was about. Spreading awareness, spreading conscientiousness about Islam. So, all in all, um, and to end, how would you describe the revolution of Imam Hussein in achieving social justice? Wow, that's a that's a very interesting question. I'd like to reference Charles Dickens here, mm. and we can go back to why he took his family with him. Charles Dickens says, "If Hussein had worldly desires in his revolution." Right? If Hussein had worldly desires, because maybe he wanted to do a revolution to become rich and become yeah. the head of state. Gain power. You yeah. know, I'll gain power, I'll gain money, I'll gain respect, I'll have a good grip on things. And you see that in communism, how they claim to serve the working class, but it started to delineate yeah. away. So Charles Dickens says this very, very clearly. If Hussein had worldly desires, then why did he take his family? Mm. And why did he take his women? Why did he take his women? So it wasn't worldly desires. So it was to establish reform, social reform, not jurisprudential reform, not, oh, hey, let's pray three rakat instead of four, mm. or you do wudu this way, or you do abolition this way, or you do this particular practice this way. The focus was social justice, and that's what they were ready to give their lives for, which in reality is the embodiment of monotheism, yep. of saying la ilaha illallah, is to live in a society where we have a egalitarian understanding. And I had to Google that word when I heard it. It mm -hmm. means to, to um, uh, propagate the idea of equality among all citizens. Mm -hmm. And you clearly see that under the government of Al-Ibn Abi Talib. And that was something the imam was ready to die for. And he did. Imam Hussein did die for that. Mm. But obviously only in physical form. Yep. Today, you see resistance groups. You see uh, 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 social groups that, that really harness that energy. Because what does Imam Sadiq say? <laughs> so that desire for reform, that desire to, to establish justice, Especially for Karbala, he said, Lan tabrud abata, lan. So it will never, it will never reach that. It's a flame that will never subside. Yeah, it's a flame that will never subside. So today, in the context of the 21st century, especially among Middle Eastern countries and Western countries, they can learn from the examples of Imam Hussein and how he conducted himself in Karbala indefinitely. And that's why you see a lot of Western ideologues speak about Imam Hussein. But unfortunately, they're not really highlighted in our um, university teachings or in yeah, our schools or definitely. in society. And in, in essence, that's why his message has remained 1400 years on where every single year in yep. the month of Muharram, we commemorate this, this revolution for social justice and where we, we basically relive the message and of course re-pledge our allegiance to a, a system that allows social justice. Of course. And Definitely. something we, we should uh, continue to work towards. 
100%. I mean, we can we can continue to talk to this about hours. There are yeah. so many other examples of how the revolution echoed. Definitely. That's a, a problem I have every year. Okay. When we're speaking about Muharram all right, and Karbala and the Ashura nights, 10 nights, all right, every night, I, you know, I could do it every single night mm. for 365 days every single year, you know, make you cry doesn't mean anything. Unless there's action. Exactly. There has to be action. Reform. You know, not just socially reform yourself. Even right? within, within yourself yeah, as well. Within Definitely. Yourself. Yeah. I think, I think it, starts, it starts by reforming yeah. yourself and then you can start Definitely. to reform society. You know, go home every single night. You know, you listen to something. Don't take it out of it. Oh, it's a sad story. I cried. I can tell you on the, on the microphone, oh, this guy got hit by a bus. He died. Yeah. Uh, see it's, you later. it's sad. It's over. Yeah. So at the end of Goodbye. the day, what, what are you going to take from that? What message are you going to take? And how are you going to implement that on yourself first and foremost and then in society as well? At, at the end of the day, um, you know, Karbala is a university. It's, it's, a, it's a lesson for all of us. Everything. You can take everything from it. You know, uh, family, brotherhood, sisterhood, um, social reformation, uh, religious reformation. I mean, there's, there's so many aspects that you can take and fix within yourself. And then spread it to, in, into your society. Definitely. Thank you very much for your time, boys. Really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Thank you Ali, for having me. Thank you very much.